Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. If I have repaid evil to him, 
who has dealt with me as a friend were plundered him who without any cause is my enemy then let my enemy pursue me and overtake me let him trample my life into the ground and lay my honor in the dust stand up O lord in your wrath and lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Rise up for me in the judgment that you have commanded. Then shall the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Lift yourself up again, O Lord, O judge of all the nations. Give sentence for me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the innocence that is in me. O oh, let the wickedness of the ungodly come to an end, but establish the just for the righteous God. Rise the very hearts and minds. God is my shield and my defense. He preserves those who are true of heart. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The first lesson, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
you'll see in your service leaflet that the reference there is to the passage that was first read in the first lesson. Actually, the second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. <coughs> then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at the right hand, and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And then the ten heard it. They were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servants. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come and dwell the praises of your people. Come, be amongst us and fill our hearts. Give us ears to listen, and Lord, speak through or in spite of me. For woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today we celebrate the Feast of St. James. I have a special affinity with the Feast of St. James. I have a son named James. Actually, I have two sons named James, kind of like George Foreman, how, you know, all of his kids are George or Georgette. My oldest son is named for a dear friend and uh, who in turn was named for St. James. And then we just really liked the name Jacob for our second son. And it wasn't until after two years of Hebrew and Greek that I found out that James and Jacob are actually the exact same name. Jacob is the Hebrew name and James is the Greek name. That's why in that period in English history under James I, we call it the Jacobean period. Yeah, I'm not very smart. Um, but back to the epistle, I guess Kim and I are in decent 
company because when we talk about James, we have to talk about which James we're talking about. Today we celebrate the feast of James the Greater, which is sort of a terrible name because it implies that there's another dude named James the Lesser, and that is what, in fact, what we call him. Maybe he, he was just shorter. That really is probably why, as he was the smaller of the two. And then there is another guy who is probably a third guy, maybe the same guy as James the Lesser, called James of Jerusalem or James the brother of Jesus. And he was either the brother or the half-brother or the cousin of Jesus, depending on a whole host of Catholic and Protestant arguments that we're not going to wade into tonight, but only because I really don't want to. So even more specifically, today is the feast of St. James the Great. And we don't know a ton about him, but we have a, a good bit that we can sort of reason from, along with the Apostle John. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, which is just a fun word to say. You try it on your way home. Zebedee. That's his dad's name. And uh, his mom's name was Salome, who also may have been called and probably was called Mary, was at the crucifixion of Jesus. It gets really confusing in the Bible because uh, there are more than one name for people. So along with John and Peter, his brother John and Peter, he was one of the sort of close crowd of three disciples that Jesus had with him at his most intimate moments. He, they were there at um, the raising of Jairus' daughter. They were there at the transfiguration together. They were there at some of the most seminal parts of the scriptural narrative, those three with Jesus. And along with John, his brother, he was nicknamed Boanerges which is a really another fun name, and it means Sons of Thunder. Why were they called Sons of Thunder? Well, it's probably because they, um, they weren't particularly calm-mannered in how they went about things. It's interesting that Jesus gathered together with him his closest three. You know, we think of these privileged three, Peter, James, and John. Well, actually, they were the three hotheads. And so Jesus kept the hotheads close to him, and um, had to sort of help them along a little bit, I, I think really is what's going on with there. We see a hint of that in, for example, Luke 12. They went to a Samaritan village, and the village did not receive them. It was inhospitable, and, and James says, Lord, do you want us to pray that fire would come down from heaven and consume the village? And Jesus rebukes him and says, chill out, James. Good grief. So today we also see in the gospel lesson, I apologize for the misprint in your bulletin, um, that is entirely the dean and rector's fault, so you can yell at him later. But in this gospel, that from the Matthean version, we have um, James and John, their mother Salome, comes to Jesus and says, look, they're good boys. She's a good Jewish mom. They're good boys. Would you grant that they would have special places in your kingdom? Of course, at this point, they're still thinking in terms of an earthly kingdom. Now, before we let James and John off the hook for this request and think that it's just on their mom, Mark's version of this same account doesn't mention mom. So it's very likely they put her up to it, and Matthew thought it was a little nicer to put it on her than on the apostles themselves. But they are thinking in terms of an earthly kingdom. They are ambitious. They see that Jesus is the one, but they are sure he has come to vanquish the Roman armies. They are sure he has come to reestablish a Jewish kingdom, and they want in on it. They want to be close to the king. Our Lord, of course, knowing what to come, responds that it is his father's role to grant the order of things in his heavenly kingdom. Yet they will indeed drink of the bitter cup that he will drink of. Indeed, all of the apostles just about are about to drink that cup. To the best of our knowledge, every apostle except John himself and Judas, who took his own life, was killed for their conviction. Ten of the twelve and the eleventh doesn't much count in the calculation. Ten of the twelve, unless we want to include St. Matthias, who was elected to take that place of Judas, who himself, according to pious tradition, was martyred, was crucified. Ten of the twelve were killed for their conviction that Jesus was the Lord. In fact, that he was the Lord God who had come to save us all. 
That was how strong their conviction, that was how serious they were about what they had seen, was that they were willing to die for it. Other pious tradition tells us that even John, the one who sort of escaped and lived to old life, that he was sentenced to die and was put in boiling oil in the Colosseum. But by a miracle of God, he survived and was therefore banished to the Isle of Patmos. Well, in today's lesson from Acts of the Apostles, we hear what happened to James the Greater. The reason why of the 12 apostles, he gets his own feast day, why he's a big deal, is because after the deacon Stephen was martyred, the first martyr in the church, James became the second. James was the second person killed for his faith in Jesus Christ, the first of the 10 apostles to die at the hands of the Romans. The cup that Jesus was to drink, the cup of salvation, led to death. But the promise of, gospel, of the gospel is that it led to something so much more than that. James, this guy who had all the ambition in the world, a young man who wanted to be at the right hand of the king, who wanted to take part in the conquering of the known world, ended up taking part in something so much better. From dreams of glory to Jesus' death lived through him. That is the legacy of St. James the Great. Jesus, of course, answers them that not only can he not grant that, but what they're asking is out of order. It is the Lord's, the princes of the Gentiles, the old King James says, the princes of the of the Gentiles who lord it over the people, but it must not be so for you. Indeed, those first apostles were the princes of the church. To this day, the princely connection we still apply to bishops, connected in an unbroken line to those first 12. But being a prince in the kingdom of God is entirely different. It is entirely different from the authority of earthly power. One scholar wrote this of this new kingdom and James's place in it. It is not warfare. It is warfare. Its warfare is not with a clash of arms or a noise of battle. Its struggles and its conflicts are much deeper and more crucial than that. For its battles are battles of the human spirit. And its enemies are the subtle and deadly demons of greed and vain ambition and pride and envy and hypocrisy, and all such perversities of spirit. This kingdom, its triumphs, are the souls of the saints. Its triumph is the renewal of spirit, a renewal of mind. In his words and in his passion, Jesus proclaims that liberty is not to be found in worldly power, worldly pride and ambition, and the satiety of the worldly desires but rather in the denial of all of these. So tonight we look at the example of St. James, one who gave up worldly ambition, worldly power, and even life itself for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he is therefore considered one of the greatest of the saints. What might our world look like? What might our lives look like if we were so willing and able to do the same? And may the words of a hymn written for this day, a verse written for this day, be our prayer. O Lord, for James we praise you, who fell to Herod's sword. He drank the cup of suffering and thus fulfilled your word. Lord, curb our vain impatience for glory and for fame. Equip us for such sufferings as glorify your name. Please stand now for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified.
Please kneel or sit as you are able. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Show your mercy upon us. O oh Lord, guide those who govern us. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. O oh Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O gracious God, your servant and apostle James was first among the twelve to suffer martyrdom for the name of Jesus Christ. Pour out upon the leaders of your church that spirit of self-denying service by which they may have true authority among your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. O oh God, the source of all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and that we, being defended from the fear of all enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Light in our darkness, we beseech you, O Lord, and by your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God and Father of all, whom the whole heavens adore, let the whole earth also worship you, all nations obey you, all tongues confess and bless you, and men and women and children everywhere love and serve you in peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the anthem.
I know you all want to stand up anyways. After that, please stand for our office hymn.
Please kneel. Before we continue, there will be a short service of Holy Eucharist. Immediately following this, you may stay seated, um, and we will do it right here at the high altar. O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.